Good morning. Welcome on this fifth Sunday during the season of Easter. I'm going to be helping out some with the service this morning, though Pastor Foote is here, uh, and he will be preaching this morning to share the Word of God with us. We will uh, begin our service with our opening hymn, number 482, This Joyful Eastertide. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We confess our sins. God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins unto God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have not undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors and ourselves. We have not seen the serve your brethren in eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, heal us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, And by his authority, 
I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty expanse. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him for His good and excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with harp and lyre. Praise Him with tambourine and dancing. Praise Him with strange instruments and jewels. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Amen. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, divine to your branches, the church which you support, hear our prayer. The world is filled with disordered thinking, voices, deceptive spirits remembering you in your incarnation and listening to your word. Bless with the rich good news of faith and joy of forgiveness and the resurrection, that we might bear abundant fruit. In your name we pray. You may be seated.
Our first reading is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Asitus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle lesson comes from the book of 1 John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Beloved, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and you have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for, for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. This is the word of the Lord. For the verse of the day in the gospel. In your bulletin on page five, you will see the verse of the day, John 15, five, we recite it together. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Uh the Holy Gospel for the fifth Sunday of Easter is recorded in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 15, beginning at the first verse. To 
Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. This is the gospel of the Lord. Our sermon hymn is hymn 589. We sing verses 1, 2, and 3. Speak, O Lord, your servant listens. In the name of God the Father, who is glorified when we bear much fruit to prove that we are Jesus' disciples, and from Jesus Christ and his word, and he is the word who cleanses us, and from God the Holy Spirit, who breathed the word of truth upon the apostles so that we might know the spirit of truth from the spirit of error. In this great God, we begin our day. I used to think I had a good sense of direction, and actually still do, but it's a much more humbled sense than what I used to have. When we first arrived in Pittsburgh years ago, I had my call at uh, Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Braddock, Pennsylvania, where the steel industry began along the Monongahela River. And my wife and I were invited to some occasion, the occasion I have forgotten, 
but I do not forget. I have not forgotten what happened on the trip. We were going uh, in downtown Pittsburgh on the Upper East Side. I believe it was the Lawrenceville area of Pittsburgh, and I was headed to a destination. I thought I knew how to get there, and I was really confident so that I didn't need to reference a map. Uh, I was confident up until the point that after I got to an intersection, I wasn't too sure. I said, okay, I need to go left. And I went that direction, traveled for about 10 minutes, pretty confident I was getting to my destination. And I arrived at the precisely same intersection 10 minutes later. I was quite unnerved. So a self-justifying word about Pittsburgh and its topography. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest where things are flat. Most of the intersections are 90 degrees. Pittsburgh is, of course, the, river, uh, the city of three rivers. Uh, it has hills and valleys. Uh, it has roads that are trapezoidal and curved and bent in all sorts of shape. It has over 100 boroughs, none of which want to be part of the other one, and I think the roads reflect that. The point is that if you add the element of darkness, you really lose all of the normal helps you have for navigation. Um, at least I could have used the shadow and the sun to figure out which way was east and west. Uh, but when I got to that intersection the second time, I was truly shaken. And I wasn't really shaken because I was afraid that I was lost. I was shaken because I was afraid that I was not the person that I thought I was. I really was confident in how I thought I could orient myself around a town, even Pittsburgh. It was kind of an identity crisis. And I began to think, how could I be so sure of something and be so lost? I was wrong about my perception of myself. I was not as good as I thought I was when it came to orienting. And when I think about what my problem was, of course, you know, this was actually before GPS was popularized in any sense of the term. Uh, I lacked a good map. I didn't want a good map. Uh, I didn't have the sunshine, as I mentioned earlier. And if I had a map or a GPS, which was really not publicly available during the day, uh, I would have had the benefit which GPS gives us. It gives us the objective layout of a map. This is the city. But it gives you the subjective position of where you are located within that city. It's really a dual way of orienting yourself that's a huge benefit. John writes about this duality in orientation in his first epistle. John says, we are from God. Whoever knows, and, uh, knows God and listens to us, whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know that the spirit of truth and the spirit of error are here. For St. John and for all faithful Christians, Scripture is our roadmap. It is the objective standard by which we orient ourselves with God. We know that we're on the road if we're on the way. We know that we are off-road if we are going our own way and not following Scripture. For John and for every Christian, the, the GPS of faith in Christ is also this duality. Faith now gives us the subjective reality of where we are on the map that is Christ's direction for our life. Jesus expressed this when he said in the gospel, I am the vine, you are the branches, we orient ourselves with our relationship with Christ and faith in him. John said it again in, in chapter 15 where uh, Jesus is speaking and John in his gospel records Jesus saying, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. Faith in Christ means that we orient ourselves to his word. And we orient ourselves to his word through Christ, who is not only the word, but the good news of the word. Whoever knows God, John said, listens to us. 
So John, by the end of the first century, when he writes his epistle, has already seen the church develop at least into what we might consider teenage years. Um, and during those teenage years, a lot of other voices have come into their life and led many astray. The primary voice being that Jesus is not really who he claimed to be. The word made flesh. And that distortion became bigger and bigger, not only at the end of the first century, but as the centuries went on. So John said, if you're a true Christian, you listen to Christ and you listen to Christ's apostles who were inspired to write the New Testament. So we have this listening to God's word and then navigating faith through our faith in Christ. You cannot have faith in Christ if you are not listening to the teaching of the apostles. Little anecdote. It has always been my desire to meet with um, all people who are outside the church. That's kind of an emphasis I have. But it's also an emphasis, and I think it's a growing emphasis at the end of your ministry to care for the sheep that have wandered from the fold. And as I engage them and I speak with them and visit with them and I listen to what they say about the way they're orienting their own spiritual life, sometimes I sit in silence amazed how far off the map they are. They are orienting themselves not according to Scripture, not according to their faith in Christ and being discipled of His Word. They're orienting themselves to the spirit of error, as John would say to the world that has spoken to them often. I mean, if you think about it, we get one hour in church and maybe 167, 166 hours outside of church. Which one is more? They listen to those voices and they get seriously distorted. And I'm amazed as their shepherd that I have also participated in allowing them to get this far off course. So what scripture teaches is a sort of living guidance, a symbiosis, a life together, which is what the word means. So as you read scripture, you read Jesus saying that you really can't live without me. If you're going to live, truly live, you are going to be connected to me. I am the vine, you are the branches. And I will bring you life that you do not have on your own. Without Christ, you're a branch. And literally, the word actually implies a branch that's more segregated from the vine than one connected. So this word symbiosis came popular back in the days of uh, the movie Finding Nemo. You may remember that Nemo was a clownfish. And he lived safe and secure as a uh, young clownfish in the midst of the tentacles of a sea anemone. Okay, and we know that sea anemones are typically toxic, toxic and they will sting and burn most fishes who swim within their anemone. But not Nemo, because clownfish are immune to it. And not only immune, but there's a mutual benefit that they give to the anemone, and the anemone gives to them. The anemone gives them pr protection, and they give the anemone a, a, a focus on cleaning those things that can deteriorate the health of their um, uh, antennae, their um, tentacles. So as you think about the anemone and you think about Nemo, you know, he got in trouble when he left the anemone. And that's when he got really, really lost. In John's epistle, he's not just giving a two-way illustration about Jesus and his word, but he's really giving us a three-way illustration. The first and most foremost way is that Christ brings us life. Without Christ, not only can we do nothing, but we can't exist vitally. We are in Christ, we are alive. We're out of Christ, we're not alive. That's the whole born again or born from above language of Jesus in John 3. Christ brings us protection. The analogy works well when we think about the sea anemone and the clownfish. But Christ also guides and protects us not only by his roadmap, scripture, but by his own direction in our soul, in our faith, as we believe in him day to day. He protects us from wandering, error, finding ourselves lost, or worse, being consumed. 
So the analogy of the clownfish does fall short when it comes to the idea of bringing life. I mean, clownfish and sea anemones uh, don't have any sort of biological genetic connection, okay? You cannot beget a clownfish from a sea anemone. But John helps us understand that G Jesus gives us life in several different ways. So here's a way that you may not have processed as you were listening to the epistle. This is verse 4. Little children, you are from God, and you have overcome them, that is the spirits that are trying to deceive you. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So John is writing this at least 40 years, maybe 50 years after his walking around Galilee with Jesus. John had the absolute benefit of not only being one of the earliest disciples, but seeing all of these incredible miracles of Jesus. And Jesus did those miracles, of course, in a way that could not be denied. And by the way, the story in Acts chapter 8 is Simon Magus, who was a magician. And magic was all over the Roman Empire. And how did they use their so-called magic? They used it for an advantage, a power advantage. That's why they would per, per, uh, sell these documents that told you that you could have power over somebody else. But John witnessed Jesus doing miracles, real miracles, not bait and switch, sleight of hand magic. He was doing real miracles that could not be denied. And you may know that the Jewish people who were in charge in Jesus' day, they issued an, uh, an arrest warrant and they accused Jesus, one of the accusations was of sorcery. They couldn't just say he didn't do these things because the miracles were too many and too profound. And so they said, well, yeah, he's doing miracles, but he's doing it by the power of the dark side. So sorcery was one of their accusations against Jesus. For us believing Christians, we know it's just a validation that he was the incarnate Christ, God in the flesh. And why did he do his miracles? Not to gain power over others, but to help them, to heal them, to strengthen them. And ultimately, he would give every bit of strength he had to buy their life back from hell and death. Jesus helped by giving life, not taking life. John heard this message. He saw the message of healing. He heard the good news of forgiveness. You know John 3.16, it appears only in John's gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you know the next verse? John 3.17. I think it's equally as potent. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Every person we see Jesus came to save. And we are an extension of that by sharing what we know and believe with those around us. So our youth had been reading a book recently, Martyrs, A Martyr's Faith in the Faithless World. And the book was written by uh, Pastor Wolf Mueller, one of the LCMS pastors who's a prominent writer like Pastor Cooper. And the book includes this excellent quote. God took upon himself the form of man, your humanity, so that he might dress himself in your rebellion and take the punishment that you deserve, and also that you can live forever with him. That really happened. No matter what else happens next, this matters most. The death of Jesus is the most significant event in the history of the world, and it is the most significant event in the history of your life and your death the cross of Jesus is the most important thing to know and to believe and understand. Beautiful words. As I think about Pastor Wolf Miller's word, and elsewhere in the book he does write about this, he alludes to it, but he's really talking about the death of Christ taking our place on the cross. I oftentimes think about the cross more and more as I age as a coin. The two sides of the cross and the two sides of Christ are being the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world and being the victorious Lamb of God who rose from the dead. I wish that he had emphasized that. So when we hear the words of John and he says, for he is 
He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He's greater than your sin. He's greater than the ability of Satan to persecute you or accuse you, which is what his name means. He speaks louder and better with his blood than Satan can speak sometimes truthfully about the things that we have done that are evil. So as we look at the third aspect, this idea of being connected to Christ and God through his word directing our life, we realize that the resurrection changes everything. That's the other side of the coin, the death side and the resurrection side. That's the side that Jesus really emphasized after death, and John writes about it because we realize that Jesus rose from the dead and conquered our sin. The resurrection changes our roadmap. No longer do we just have sort of a 2D or even a 3D roadmap. We now see the visible and the invisible. That book, which the youth read, was about martyrdom. And it was saying that we need that sort of faith. I mean, the early martyrs, the earliest martyrs, were all witnesses, eyewitnesses of the resurrection. Stephen, the chapter that happens just before chapter 8, which you heard read. Whole chapter devoted to the first martyr. The word means witness. He could easily give up his life because not only did he see Christ after he died and rose again, but he saw him at the point that Stephen would die. He saw Jesus at the right hand of God. We see the resurrection of Christ by faith. Jesus told people ahead of time that you could actually have this roadmap of resurrection by the gift of faith and the more you use it, the more you live there, the more you orient yourself to say, I'm not just going to heaven, I am in heaven. This becomes a sort of dynamic, symbiotic map where Christ is in me and now the vine is giving life and direction to the fruit. John 5, 24 expresses this so clearly. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. You've got it now. That's my word. You do not come into judgment, Jesus continues, but you have passed out of death into life. We are living as resurrected branches connected to Jesus, the resurrected one, the vine. It is a living road. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's not just the way. He is the life. And what John is saying to us is when you have that way of relating to him by faith in him and orienting, you've got his roadmap. You know things that are wrong. You know things that are right. But far more than that, you're walking on life and in life. Christ is in you, the resurrected one. We share that now. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which goes beyond what we understand, stand guard over our hearts and minds to keep us strong in Christ, our living Lord. Amen. We now rise and we sing the offertory. The offertory is hymn 589, verse 4. Speak, O Lord, your servant listens. Confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. 
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke for the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. This time we gather your prayers and your offerings. You may be seated. We pray. Oh, Jesus Christ, Scripture is not just a map. It is living and active. Through that word, alive, you pierce our heart. You condemn us. Through that word, you bring us to life with the good news of salvation. Our sin is on you. Your life is in us. Help us, Lord, through the guidance of your symbiotic word to live life in the resurrection, confident that we have already passed from death into life. You are the living vine, and we are branches connected to you and your life. Help us always rely in you and your word far more than messages of the world. In Christ we pray, amen. I have a prayer from the Burlus. Um, Dick uh, just shared this a moment ago that is dealing with a significant vertigo today. Um, and I thank Dick for serving in spite of that burden. Um, and Peg has a cardiac ablation this Wednesday. Glad it's here because I had forgotten that. We'll be praying for you on Wednesday also, Peg. Uh, another prayer for peace on earth. Amen to that. 
Um, Dan Clark had surgery, must have been far away. Uh, may God bless him with a speedy recovery. We also um, pray for Jeanette Reeves, who is um, at the end of her life, apparently, in the nursing home, and strength to Michelle and the whole family as they um, console her, thankful for her confession of Christ as her living Lord. Um, we also would like to remember Denny Ryan. Uh, many of you do not know Denny Ryan. Denny Ryan is a longtime member who has uh, uh, transferred to another Lutheran church because they moved away, and now he's up uh, far north. Denny has uh, experienced some significant weakening in the past week, and he doesn't really know what's going on, um, and we pray for him. Let's rise for these prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your body, the church, connected to you. We thank you for leaders in the church. We are thankful for Dick Burlew, one of our elders, and we pray that you would bless his body, that the vertigo would pass, and that you would give him strength, not only um, with his balance, but strength uh, with the other issues he has with his leg and back. Uh, we pray for Peg, who will be going through cardiac ablation this Wednesday. Uh, bless those who care for her and help her to be healed uh, and stronger. Um, we ask, Lord, that you, the Prince of Peace, um, would bring us peace. Uh, we ask, Lord, that there would be a cessation of hostility, and more than that, that there would be generosity and love uh, towards others. We thank you, Lord, for uh, bringing Dan Clark through surgery. We pray that you would uh, bless him as he recovers and that it would be a speedy recovery. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, be with Denny Ryan, who was here when this church was built uh, and helped actually build it. We pray, Lord, that you would bless his body as he recovers um, from some unknown ailment um, we ask, Lord, that there would be a, a medical intervention if possible. Um, and I thank you, Lord, for his faith uh, that he does rest in you. Be with Jeanette Reeves as she um, is uh, declining and under care. Guide the family as they try to make decisions with her about the best kind of care to receive. Um, and bless her soul that she would cast every burden she has upon you because you care for her. We ask this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. We prepare for the celebration of the sacrament with the preface. It's on page 7 in your bulletin and 177 in your hymnal. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and proper, Lord, that we should always praise and thank you in light of the resurrection. You are the living Lamb of God who stands before us to show us our sins are paid for in full and the promise is life everlasting with you. Therefore, we evermore praise you and say, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. 
grants us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us to do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers and deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had supped and given thanks, he gave it to them and he said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please rise. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. I have a couple of announcements. This Thursday is the National Day of Prayer. We pray anyway, so uh, Thursday is also prayer and pie, so you're invited to come Thursday at 9 for prayer, followed by pie. Um, and Bob or Dick, do you have an announcement? There's going to be a meeting. Yes, uh, I need to turn up some, uh, we're having trouble with the copy right now. Thank all of uh, you folks for mowing. I appreciate it very much. Uh, Darcy. Oh, no, it's not Darcy. I got the wrong hand. Lisa. It looked like, looked like Darcy's hand, but she's in the back. Thanks to you and Pastor Cooper for leading that. And thanks, Pastor Cooper, for being able to help out this week uh, since we're, our elders are away or, as you know, not feeling strong. Uh, yes, one more announcement. Yes, Vivian? We're trying to resurrect the lunch bunch. So if anybody would like to join us for lunch, we're going to have lunch over at the uh, Spring Buffet by Lowe's. Okay, very good. All right. Let us depart with the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace.